All right, so it is 6.05. I'll go ahead and get us started. So welcome everyone to AIAA's third and final GBM of fall quarter. Tonight, we are honored to welcome Paul Bevilacqua, a distinguished lecturer. So before we start, I would like to begin with some event updates that we have coming up. So next week on Monday, we have another Presenting You workshop about internship applications. Um, we're going to be talking about some of the local aerospace companies who may be looking for interns right now and how the process goes to apply for internships um, as an engineer, specifically aerospace engineering, since that is what we're all about. So more details, including the Zoom link, are on our Facebook page. So please check that out. And it would really help us out if you indicated um, going to the event, um, just so we have an estimate of who um, or how many people will be coming. So our last event of the quarter is our week 10 social. Um, if you've been part of AIAA for a while, you know that we usually like to host um, our annual breakfast for dinner uh, de-stressor at the end of each quarter, I should say. Um, but since we can't do that right now, we are hosting a really fun um, virtual social for week 10 on uh, Monday, December 7th. Uh, more details will be announced on our Facebook page soon. So yeah, that's uh, the last two events we have for this quarter. Um, it'd be great to see you all there. Okay, so now I will go ahead and introduce Mr. Bevilacqua. So Lockheed Martin won the Joint Strike Fighter competition when the X-35 demonstrator aircraft made a short takeoff, went supersonic, and then landed vertically, the first time any aircraft had accomplished this feat. This was made possible by its innovative dual cycle propulsion system invented by Paul Bevilacqua. Mr. Bevilacqua earned his BS in aerospace engineering at the University of Notre Dame and a PhD in aeronautics and astronautics at Purdue University. He is a fellow of the American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics and a member of the National Academy of Engineering and his propulsion system win the Collier Trophy, which each year recognizes the greatest achievement in aeronautics or astronautics in America. So without further ado, I will hand it over to Mr. Bevilacqua. Thank you, Brenda. Let me uh, bring up my screen. Which I hope you can all see. So when uh, Brenda asked me to um, do this presentation, I asked her, how long would you give me? And she said, well, you know, keep it under an hour or so, which reminded me of something my daughter said when we first moved to California. She was about five years old and the guys at work said, you got to take a drive in the wine country in the hills behind Santa Barbara where Kelly Johnson, who started the Skunk Works, and Michael Jackson and Ronald Reagan had these Hollywood ranchettes. So we were driving down this two lane country road and she saw one of those oil wells that looks like a dipping bird. She said, mommy, what is that thing? And Marilyn says, well, why don't you ask your daddy? He's an engineer. She says, no, I don't want to know that much about it. So um, in an hour, I won't be able to tell you that much about the uh, Joint Strike Fighter, but I hope I'll give you a feeling for the program. This is a Wright Brothers lecture, so I'd like to tell you something about the Wright Brothers and how they added to the program. They um, not only showed us how to fly, but how to invent an airplane. They began with a skeptical study of the relevant literature and accepted some stuff and said some was wrong and they had to run their own experiments. They were innovative. Um, in Europe, people were trying to build airplanes that would fly like airships or ships. There'd be a helmsman and a captain and the captain would say steer course 270 and the helmsman would set the course and the ship would stay on that course. But um, they were running into troubles controlling the airplane and the Wright brothers being bicycle mechanics, bicycle salesmen, 
um, realized that you could take an inherently unstable vehicle and the pilot could get in the loop and control it. And that was their real contribution. Um, the ability to uh, put the pilot in the loop and control the airplane. They were brothers, and so when one had an idea, the other one would say, yes, but, and uh, they'd discuss it to hammer out the weaknesses. And as the godfather used to say, it's nothing personal, just business. They proceeded systematically in their testing from wind tunnels to kites to gliders before they tried to fly an airplane. And uh, we don't often remember, but they were part of a team. Charles Taylor was their mechanic. They designed the airplanes, but he built the airplane and the engine and uh, although we don't recognize them in the AIAA, the ASME has a Charles Taylor Award in Manufacturing in recognition of his contributions. So as I say, they uh, sort of provided the guidance for the way we developed the Joint Strike Fighter, and this is an outline of my presentation today. These are the three airplanes that the Joint Strike Fighter is intended to complete, uh, replace. They, um, all had certain shortcomings. They were designed at the same time. They weren't stealthy and they were small. They didn't have the range. And in particular, the Harrier wasn't supersonic. But the program didn't start out as a joint strike fighter program. It started out as a program for the Marine Corps to develop a supersonic Harrier or an F-18 that could land vertically. Basically, the Marines go ashore, they're an expeditionary force, which means they don't have heavy artillery and they rely on aircraft to um, provide close air support. But in Guadalcanal during World War II, the uh, Japanese were reinforcing the island from the other side. And so the Navy pulled their carrier, aircraft carriers back and left the airplanes with the Marines on the ground without air cover and they were bombed and strafed and had a terrible time of it till they uh, finished an airfield and were able to bring some airplanes ashore. So they were after an airplane they could come ashore without having an airfield already built. And uh, they settled on the Harrier, which is subsonic and performs admirably in the role of uh, close air support, but it's not supersonic, it's not a real fighter. So they have to rely on the Navy to provide top cover and that's the F-18 and they're still based on the carriers and they want it to be independent. Plus they had two airplanes. So they needed two sets of mechanics, two sets of pilots, two sets of supply lines, two sets of um, manuals, etc. And they wanted to simplify. So why is the Harrier unsuitable? Well, here are two airplanes that were designed out by the same time. The Harrier has 20,000 pounds of thrust it can only go Mach 0.85. And the Starfighter has 15,000 pounds of thrust, but can reach Mach 2. And the reason is what you can see in this two views of the airplanes, the Harrier has a large fan that makes it thick. And as you know, when you go uh, supersonic, the viscous drag gets smaller, the induced drag practically vanishes, but the wave drag gets terrific. There's a drag rise. And this wide fan made the Harrier's drag rise prohibitive and they couldn't push through it to supersonic speeds. So why the big fan? Well, let's look at thrust per horsepower. Um, you can increase thrust by increasing the mass flow or increasing the velocity since thrust is the product of mass flow and velocity. And thrust per horsepower is the mass flow divided by the energy, the power is equivalent to energy units and so if we uh, um, cross out the MV, we're left with two over V. So that says that you wanna decrease the jet velocity to get a high thrust for given horsepower. Or because the weight equals the thrust equals M dot V, you can also see that you need to increase the mass flow. So here's a plot showing the um, mass flow and velocity, showing that uh, you get a lot more efficient, a lot more effective um, thrust per horsepower if you accelerate a large mass flow to a small velocity. So a helicopter, for example, is a lot more efficient in hover than a rocket, which has high velocity jets, but relatively small mass flows. So 
I was new to the Skunk Works, and I thought um, they have a reputation for innovation. Well, I'll brainstorm with some skunks, and we'll come up with something brilliant, and that'll solve the problem. But uh, we would brainstorm and come up with an idea, and then we'd search the literature and look at the patents and find that somebody had already thought of it and had, in many cases, built an airplane that didn't work. So I created what I call the Wheel of Misfortune. These are 50 airplanes that got to flight test of various VSTOL concepts, but only the Harrier down there around 5, 30, 6 o'clock was successful. <clears throat> but there were a lot of lessons to be learned. The very first VSTOL airplanes were right after World War II. People said, well, fighters have thrust to weight ratios of nearly one, and the new missiles take off vertically. So why don't we turn some airplanes on their tail and um, boost the thrust a little bit and get a super uh, vertical takeoff. <coughs> Excuse me just a minute. So this is Lockheed's um, demonstrator aircraft. It took off and transitioned to horizontal flight well enough, <coughs> but it had problems coming in for landing. The pilot would slow down and his lift came off the wings. He would have to rotate the airplane to a higher angle of attack so that the thrust vector could compensate for the loss of wing lift. And the pilots found that they couldn't see below them. So they uh, had to do a zoom climb. They were afraid of losing altitude and they ended up hanging upside down. They couldn't see the ship. They couldn't tell how high up they were, and they basically said, this is an unworkable, impractical idea. So Kelly gave the remaining money back to the Navy and said, let's not waste any more money on this. <clears throat> so in the second generation, they kept the airplane horizontal, and they put vertical lift engines in it. But the lift engines had to be at the CG, where you want to put fuel and payload and other expendables. Um, so that was a problem. The lift engines were dead weight in cruise and the cruise engine was dead weight in hover. And in addition, <coughs> the hot gases from the lift engines would hit the ground, run together and splash back up on the airplane, melt the aluminum, blow out the tires, etc. <coughs> so in the next generation up in the upper right there, they used the same engine for lift and cruise, but rotated the, the engine. And that solved the problem of dead weight, but um, it, it left the same problem of hot gas ingestion. And uh, the engines didn't run at low speeds and high angles of attack as the inlet stalled. So finally, the British came up with the concept of the Harrier, which uses a single engine, but instead of vectoring the engine, they realized all they had to vector was the thrust. <coughs> so the short history is first we tilted the airplane, then we tilted the engines, then we vectored the engines, and finally realized all we have to vector was the thrust. <clears throat> so as I mentioned, we were having trouble coming up with something innovative, so I had to do some research into invention and innovation, creativity. And they said, basically, our minds work like by analogy. So electricity is like water. It flows against the resistance driven by a pressure, the voltage. An atom is like a solar system. There's a nucleus, which is like the sun and the electrons, which are like planets in orbits. And uh, so the way to solve a problem is to find a similar problem with a known solution and use the analogous solution for your problem. And that's why they gave us these tests in the seventh grade of uh, showing you five or six different objects and saying, what do they have in common? So take a look at this test I made up. What three things, do, what three things have something in common here? Well, the answer is the airplane, the frying pan and the clock because they're all made out of metal. And the assumption was that people who were good at these kinds of problems would be good at seeing the connections between their problem and something they knew, and they would use that to solve their solution. Um, 
Here's a classical example from the Wright brothers. The story is that the, um, Wilbur Wright came up with the idea of wing warping when he was sitting in his bicycle shop one afternoon idly twisting the cardboard box that the inner tubes came in. And it occurred to him that the angle of attack increased on one side and decreased on the other, which is just what you needed to roll the aircraft and bank it into a turn. <coughs> and here's the picture of the, their patent showing that that's basically the concept they used. So by analogy, here's another more recent example. The um, F-117 has these weird large facets on them. Why facets? Well, when we sent our first helicopters to Vietnam, they had bubble canopies. And a bubble canopy is like a disco ball. You know, they have mirrors on them and one spotlight. And wherever the, um, you are in the room, there's a point on the disco ball where there will be an angle of incidence equals angle of reflection and there'll be this light on you. So the helicopters would fly below the ridge lines up valleys to stay below the radar. But the Viet Cong up, um, observers could then sit on the mountaintops, look down into the valley and trace the path of the helicopter and radio ahead to their buddies who would stand with arm's length apart, shoot straight up in the air and the helicopter would fly over a barrage. So the first helicopters designed for Vietnam didn't have bubble canopies anymore. They had flat panels. And with a flat panel, if the observer happens to be in the right spot at the right time, he'll see a glint. But as soon as the helicopter moves, the angle changes and he doesn't see it anymore. Well, Dennis Overholzer was an avionics engineer in the Skunk Works. And he knew something about the electromagnetic spectrum. There's visible light. Next to it to the left is infrared and beyond that is radar waves, microwave and then longer and longer wavelengths. So he thought, well, radar waves will probably be, behave the same as the light waves. And so they put facets on the F-117 like the facets on the windows of the helicopters. And so that's what an F-117 looks like to a radar. There are a few directions where there's a spike and if you happen to be at the right point at the right time, you'll see a flash, but most of the time there's nothing to reflect it towards, you won't see anything. So as I mentioned, if you were good at those tests, they said you had a high IQ, but for the rest of us, they have come up with techniques to help us make associations. One of the techniques that we've used in the Skunk Works, it works okay most of the time, is to say, how would someone in nature solve a problem? So if an animal wants to go from here to there, um, you could burrow under the ground or you're a rabbit, you could go from tree to tree. Or um, if you're an eagle, you'd fly over. Or if an elephant, you wouldn't care. You just march to where you're going because you're real king of the jungle. Um, what about famous people? Suppose a famous person had your problem. Think about how they would solve it. So we tried that. Um, suppose it was Hercules. Well, he would take a brute force approach like the Harrier. Suppose it was Houdini. Well, he would make it appear that he had an airplane that could hover, but it wouldn't really. And there were some airplanes like that tried too. But the method that I found worked best was the method of forced associations. Basically, you have to state your problem clearly. So I looked at the um, airplane. I said, well, the Marines want an F-18 that can go vertical or a Harrier that can go supersonic. I know what the problem with the Harrier is. What will it take? to make a F-18 go vertical. Well, nominal takeoff weight is 37,000 pounds and it only has 22,000 pounds of dry thrust. And even in afterburner, it only has 36,000 pounds of dry thrust. So if you had 37,000 pounds, you could hover, but you couldn't accelerate upwards or stop a deceleration downwards because you need thrust greater than weight to do that. So we like to use a factor of 1.2, 20% excess thrust. And that turns out to be 44,000 pounds in the case of the um, F-18. And the problem was that there's not enough thrust and it's too far aft. So a vertical F-18, diesel F-18, would have 22,000 pounds of thrust at the rear and another 22,000 pounds on an equal moment arm at the front of the airplane to balance it. And so the method of forced association says, now break down what it takes to accomplish that goal 
into steps. So the steps were you have to extract power from the engine, transfer the power to the front of the airplane and turn it into thrust. And then you brainstorm each of those steps. So how can you extract power from a hot high pressure gas? You can do it with a turbine or a scoop off some of the gases or use a heat pipe or use it to run an alternator generator, uh, generate electric power, sew it with ions, put it through a superconducting magnet, use magneto hydrogen. I'm sorry? Magneto hydrodynamics or electrofluid dynamics. You can use it to pump a laser, run some chemical, power some chemical uh, reaction. How do you transfer power from the back of the airplane to the front? You can duct the gases, you can run the heat pipes to the front, you can use some sort of mechanical drive, you can beam it up there, run it through wires, um, hydraulic pressure, friction, etc. And how can you produce thrust? Burn more fuel, ejectors, fans, rockets, reverse the MHD and EFD processes, reverse the chemical reaction and extract the power again. So we tried that and we came up with some innovative schemes. For example, one that I liked was um, you use the hot press, high pressure gas to pump a gas dynamic laser. You generate a beam of energy, which you focus at the front of the airplane, cause the air to expand and explode and create sort of a pulse jet. They were innovative. No one had thought of them before, but not very practical, we decided. And I had a nine month contract from DARPA and the Marine Corps to see if we could come up with something. And I'd spend eight months studying the other airplanes, studying innovation and creativity. And I had to write a final report. So I sat down, I said, well, the best way to get power out of a hot high pressure gas is the way we always do it in the aerospace with a turbine. And the best way to transfer power forward is with a shaft. It's small and light, doesn't add anything to the cross-sectional area of the airplane. And the best way to produce thrust is to put the power into a large mass flow of air at a low velocity, put a helicopter into the airplane or a fan. And so I said, all right, so here's the concept. You vector the thrust at the rear, you run a shaft, um, the shaft on the fan out further and run it to a lift fan. And that gives you two posts, which you can vary the thrust to control the airplane and pitch, but you need to control it in yaw as well. So I would duct off some of the air from the cruise fan of the cruise engine and use that in the wingtips for roll control. And then I could vector either of those four jets front and aft, side to side for yaw control. But ducting off the fan air created a problem. The nozzle is too big. It's sized for all the airflow and I've taken some of the airflow out, off so it will reduce the back pressure on the turbine the engine would overspeed and blow up. So you'd have to close the nozzle down. And then I had one of those aha moments. I said, wait a minute, that's just what I want. I want to extract more power from the engine and I want to use it to run the lift fan. So basically I'd run it like a car. You put the car in neutral, disengage the clutch. You step on the gas, you open the throttle. The engine accelerates and if it doesn't have a rev limiter on it, it'll expand and speed up till it blows up. But if you engage the clutch or put it in drive and step on the gas, the power goes into accelerating the mass of the vehicle instead of the mass of the engine and the engine doesn't blow up. So that became the basic propulsion system as it exists in the Joint Strike Fighter. I didn't need an extra turbine stage to extract the power. I just changed the operating point of the existing turbine stage. So about 10 years ago now, I guess, Aviation Week did a special issue on creativity and they cited this uh, pro JSF propulsion system as an example of aerospace innovation. And the next week, some wise guy wrote a letter to the editor and said, What's so innovative about that? You got an engine driving a fan. That seems pretty obvious. Sad state for America if that's as innovative as we can be. So let me talk a little bit more about how it works and see to show you why it is an innovation. Before the Joint Strike Fighter, there were two kinds of turbine engines, what we call a jet engine or a turbofan engine that provides jet thrust, but no shaft power or a turbo shaft engine like they use in locomotives and ships. And then there was a couple of turbine cars, 
helicopters that produce shaft power, but no effective thrust. And here's the difference between them, a very simple sketch. Um, on the top, we have a turbofan engine. So you have a fan and compressor stages that pull the air in. Then you burn fuel to heat it up and you run it through a turbine, which extracts enough power to run the fan. And then the energy left in the high, high pressure gases, you squirt out a nozzle like a rocket to produce thrust. In fact, the engine companies call everything in front of the nozzle the gas generator, because its purpose is to generate a hot high pressure gas, just like a rocket. In a turbo shaft engine, you have an additional turbine stage or stages to extract the power from the hot high pressure gas and use it to run a shaft, which can be then used to power some other device. But there's no thrust left in the exhaust of the uh, gases because you've taken the energy out. Here's the TS diagram, which I'm sure you all remember from sophomore thermodynamics. <laughs> um, the lower white curve is atmospheric pressure. And the upper one is the maximum pressure in the engine. And entropy is the X, lower x-axis, which increases as you go through the engine and incur losses. So um, ignoring those losses, you, you do work on the air as it comes in by the work of compression. Then you burn fuel, you add heat energy, you take work out with the turbine. And because the curves are further apart on the right than they are on the left, when you take the work out to run the compressor, you end up with the energy you added with the fuel, which you can use to produce thrust or shaft horsepower. And then because the curves move upward, when you come back to atmospheric pressure at the back of the engine, you have some unavoidable heat you can't recover, then that's the waste heat in the exhaust. I didn't want to go through thermodynamics with every congressional staffer or admiral that I had to talk about. So I created what I call a TX diagram. It's the same curve, but now it's laid out along the axis of the engine. So as you go through the fan and compressor stages, you do the work of compression. Then you go through the combustor, you have fuel burn, take the power out with the turbine. And then what's left, you can use to run in a nozzle thrust and produce a jet thrust. And then there's that unavoidable waste heat. When you go to the lift fan power cycle, you take more power out with the lift fan, leaves less at the rear, and you don't change the waste heat really. People say it works like a turbocharger, but it doesn't really. Turbocharger takes that waste heat and uses it. We're using the energy that previously had gone into the jet exhaust and used it to, to produce shaft power. And those numbers are representative of modern jet engines. Here's how it works. This is a turbine map. So at any engine speed, the normal conventional operating line is the one where it passes through the points of maximum efficiency. And at the cruise point, you're at maximum efficiency. But the engine will operate off design at less efficient points. So for example, at maximum power, you can move from the optimum point to a point near the stall point pick up 30,000 additional shaft horsepower and your efficiency drops from 99 to 95%, 4% loss of efficiency, but you're only in hover for 15 seconds or so. So that's a small price to pay during a short interval in the mission to pick up 30,000 shaft horsepower to run the uh, lift fan. So here's the equation, the turbine power equation. I call it the most powerful equation in the world. M dot C sub P delta T. Um, it says that the more mass flow you heat, hotter it is. T04 is the turbine temperature ent at the entrance of the turbine at the exit of the combustor section. And T05 is the temperature at the exit of the turbine section. But you can factor out T04 and you're left with a temperature ratio across the turbine, which you can then use the isentropic flow equations to turn into a pressure ratio. So that bottom equation is really the key form of the, of the um, power equation. T04 is the way we conventionally control the pot thrust of an engine. We burn more fuel, make it hotter, and that creates more power in the turbine so that the engine speeds up until the compressor absorbs that extra power. 
comes to new equilibrium speed, pumping more air and more thrust. But you can also change the power of the turbine by changing the pressure drop across the turbine. So let's look at the PX diagram. Here's the pressures through the engine. Again, the pressure rises through the fan and compressor stages and then drops back to atmospheric pressure in two stages through the turbine and through the nozzle. We are taught that the turbine works like a turbine blade, a fan or an airfoil generating lift that spins it. But you can also look at the passage between the turbine blades as a nozzle. And from F equals MA for the force on the blades, there's an equal and opposite reaction of the uh, jet flow. So those turbines have a tangential component of their exhaust flow that causes the turbine to spin. They're like those water sprinklers with a little L hook on the end that spin around and cause the water to scatter all over the lawn. So when you open the nozzle up, you decrease the pressure drop across the rear nozzle, but it still has to get back to atmospheric pressure. So the turbine pressure drops becomes greater. That means the jet coming out of the turbines is squirting with more thrust that spins the turbine harder, creates the extra work to drive the lift fan. Let me show you that again. So here's the cruise mode where the turbine pressure drop and the nozzle pressure drop are about the same. You open the nozzle up, or in our case, you take the fan air out of the exhaust nozzle and the pressure drop across the exhaust nozzle decreases so the pressure drop across the turbine nozzle has to increase. So we had a uh, propulsion concept that took advantage of the good features of the Harrier and avoided the bad features. We used fans for thrust augmentation. We vectored the thrust, not the engine. We had hot gases at the rear, cold flow up front. We used lift improvement devices, which take that fountain that bounces up from the ground and throws it back down and gives you a little boost and lift as you get into ground effect. <coughs> However, the Harrier had a poor supersonic area distribution. It needed lots of power, so it had reduced engine life due to the fact that you, you had to overtemp it. It was 300 hours to replace an engine, whereas a typical fighter is more like 2,000 hours. It had to carry water around to inject into the turbines to keep them from melting. And the four lift jets actually produced hot fountains, warm fountains that went into the inlets. <clears throat> and they used compression air, compressor air instead of fan air for reaction controls. We had two little fans instead of two, one big fan. So a good supersonic area distribution, <clears throat> no reduction in engine life, no water injection required two lift jets and two roll control jets. So there's a fence, which I'll show you later, that aerodynamic fence that keeps the hot gases from getting forward into the inlet. And we use fan air rather than um, compressor air for reaction control. So I needed to put a final picture sketch of the concept together. And at that time, that's what a stealthy airplane looked like. So that was the original sketch that I submitted in my final report for the Joint Strike Fighter. You can see that the um, lift fan is on the same axis as the engine fan like the Harrier and uses Harrier type vectoring nozzles. <clears throat> so DARPA and the Marine Corps said, we like your idea, that's a nice sketch, but it doesn't mean anything. We need a real conceptual design. We wanna move fast on this. So we'll give you a contract and to avoid the need to um, have an RFP and a proposal evaluation, we'll give another contract to McDonnell Douglas who is building the F-15 and General Dynamics who is building the F-16 and have you all do a stealthy Stovall strike fighter. Um, GD and McDonnell Douglas were also working with NASA on an unclassified, unstealthy advanced Stovall program. So they had concepts they only had to adapt to stealth for the DARPA and the Marine Corps. <laughs> but DARPA did something very clever. The normal, usual kind of um, 
RFP would say, here's what we want the airplane to do. And you build us the cheapest airplane you can and the cheapest one will win. So in this case, they said Mach 1.5 and seven and a half Gs. And our job was to build the lightest airplane that met those points with a little margin. But they said, um, we don't know what the right combination is. We've never done a stealthy fighter before. The F-117, although it has an F designation, it's a bomber. It has no gun, no air-to-air -air weapons. It's strictly a bomber. It relied 100% on stealth for survivability. So you can achieve a given level of survivability, shown by the dotted line there, at low speeds by having a highly maneuverable aircraft that can jink and avoid getting shot at. Or if you're fast enough, you don't need to jink at all. You fly past before they even know you're there. And you don't need to maneuver at all. And where the stealth therefore is, we don't know. So what we're gonna do is tell you what we can afford. We can afford an F-18, we'll give you 5% cost margin for what you have to do to the airplane. And you tell us what the right combination of stealth, maneuvers, Gs, range, payload, all those things are. And um, keep the cost to the F-18 plus 5%. And if we like it, we bu we'll buy it. And if we don't, we won't. So we had one requirement, 24,000 pound airplane, because they said an airplane costs $1,500 per pound. And that's what uh, $1,500 works out to, 24,000 pounds. So here's your challenge, our challenge. The F-16 was Mach 2, cost 28 million, and they sold 4,600 of them. The F-15 was Mach 2.5, cost 52 million, and they only sold 1,200 of them. The SR-7 was Mach 3 plus, cost 135 million, they only sold 30 of them. That's a classic example of the Pareto 80-20 rule you may have heard about. Pareto was an Italian civil engineer, and he noticed that 20% of his customers provided 80% of his business. And he also observed in his garden that 20% of his plants produced 80% 80% of the vegetables. And he noticed that in Europe, 20% of the people owned 80% of the land. So he described that, published it as a Pareto rule that you the last 20% of performance runs 80% of the cost, as you see here. And there's the F-16, F-14-15, and SR-71 as classic examples. So if you want to um, do something cheap and affordable, which was our requirement, you look for the knee of the curve. You don't put on a gold plate. You don't put too much capability into it. You don't take on too many challenges. And that's a classic um, approach that Skunk Works always took. Here's the P-80. A lot of people don't realize it, <clears throat> but the U-2 is a P-80 with sailplane wings on it. The F-90 is a P-80 with swept wings on it. And the F-104 is a P-80 with thin wings on it. There are numerous parts that are identical on those, those three airplanes. And the F-117, the one miracle, which is the basic axiom for the Skunk Works to reduce technical and market risk, Stealth was what we were after. We didn't need to develop a new set of displays, so they came out of the F-18. We didn't need new engines. They came out of the F-18 as well. The landing gear came out of the F-15. The flight control computer came out of the F-16. So you use off-the-shelf systems for everything but stealth in this case, the one miracle. That reduces your risks and your costs, especially in demonstrations. So that's the basic Skunk Works approach. You find the knee of the curve, you build a prototype, you test it, you fix what breaks, and you're on the ramp performing a mission. The rule is to get to a prototype fast. We're not much for optimizing. The philosophy is a good design tested now is better than an optimal perfect design tested next year. Because if you're doing something that's never been done before, you're only optimizing your ignorance. You don't know what you're gonna run into, what problems you're gonna run into. And it's pointless to try to think you're optimizing what you don't know anything about. Get close enough, 80%, 20% of the cost, build it, fly it, find out what really doesn't work, fix that, and you're in business. 
Here's another reason. Here are two airplanes that were designed at the same time, one in England, one in America, to perform basically the same mission. Similar ranges, similar payloads, but look at the difference in the wing area. The spans are not too far apart. Huge different aspect ratio, and therefore in the lift and drag coefficients. But look at the bottom line, the yellow Ds. They're practically the same. So you could spend a lot of time optimizing one concept or the other, arguing about it, which one you're going to adopt. Doesn't matter. Pick one, test it, find out what it works, and get it into production. So basically, we're using lean methods. Um, the lean methods were developed by Henry Ford, actually, and perfected by Toyota. But they are for processes that are repetitive. A factory produces many copies of the same part. An office process is the same form again and again. But design is a one-time process. When you're done with the design process, you say, boy, that was a mess. We could have done that a lot better. But there's no point. You've got your design. So we adopt the fundamental lean principles. Add what your customer values and eliminate waste, gold plating. And those are the principles we apply to the design process. Now, to get to our design. Um, the F-117 had large facets because the analytic solutions from that Russian math mathematician um, required you to have large panels relative to the size of the um, wavelength of the radar waves. By the time this had come along, we had digital solutions um, and were able to then put smooth surfaces, which we panel with many small panels. And this is what I'm going to show you what the signature of a stealthy airplane looks like. Red is large signatures, blue is low signatures. So here's some generic kind of airplane. And in the first you do see just colors. So blue in front and in back. So the bad guys can't see you coming. And if a pilot is put on your six by ground control intercept radars, the modern IR and radar guided missiles can't see you to lock on. So that's what it looks like to a radar. The energy has to go somewhere, so it goes out to the sides. This is a semi log plot, so I'm not telling you how many cycles there are. So it's not really indicating the relative magnitudes, but it shows you the basic principle. So when people say, oh, we saw the stealth airplane on our radar, well, yeah, if it's to the side, you can see it. But try to get behind it and lock on and shoot at it. That's where the trick comes in. So we had to come up with a new design. We had no guidelines. We didn't know what a stealthy fighter should look like. So we started looking at the options. For wing platform, we could have a straight wing or a delta wing or an aft swept wing or a forward swept wing. With a wing position, we could have a low wing, high wing, or anywhere in between. For horizontal stabilizers, we could have a flying wing, a wing body tail, a canard body tail, or a three surface airplane. Vertical stabilizers could have a six, single one on the tail, twin verticals, twin verticals on the wingtip, thrust vectoring instead of verticals. Inlet location, we could have a low inlet, high inlet, nose inlet, side inlets. And the problem was, it's an unmanageable approach. We knew what our fuselage looked like. It had a lift engine with a lift fan and a pilot. But we pick one wing platform. There are four options for stabilizers, four options for inlets, four options for tails. You cannot design every airplane with every combination and fly them all on the mission and pick the best one. You have to do some preliminary sorting. So what we did was we came up with a list of Criteria, must have, supersonic, stovel, stealthy, supportable, affordable, um, nice to have, and important to have. And then we ranked the various combinations of uh, alternatives, design alternatives against them. And I brought in experts from all the fields <clears throat> and they gave their opinions. And unfortunately, it was good for me as the chief engineer to get all the inputs, but it wasn't a very good team building exercise. Guys would get into arguments. I was hoping they weren't going to hit each other about whether it was a two or a three on some factor. And when we decided it was a three, the guy who had argued for a two stomped out of the room mad and said, I'm getting my boss to come back and tell you why you're doing it wrong. 
but we came up with a design. The other problem, of course, is people come from different backgrounds and they have different views of what an airplane ought to look like. Um, this drawing is from the 1930s, but it actually is still appropriate. You can see there around five o'clock what a propulsion group thinks the engine airplane looks like. There's an engine in some dust cover over it. Um, there's the aerodynamics group at three at nine o'clock. They like it really simple, clean. The stress group likes a nice straight load path so they can analyze it easily. The equipment group wants to put everything on the airplane, including a lifeboat in case the pilots has to dish at sea. <clears throat> the one thing we couldn't settle on was whether to put an aft swept wing like the F-117 or a delta wing. So stereolithography was a new technology. It was actually invented by a company in Los Angeles that was about 20 miles down the road from our plant. And so we bought one of the first commercial systems they put out and built a RCS model and a wind tunnel model with interchangeable aft swept wings and delta wings and chose the delta wing. So that's what our initial concept looked like. Three surfaces, but uh, we use the horizontals and verticals as one surface of V-tail for both horizontal and um, lateral stability. These were the three design missions deck launched intercept, combat air patrol, and close air support. Deck launched intercept is where you're on the beach, you get word that the enemy aircraft are coming and you have to take off and intercept them before they reach the beach and start strafing your guys. Combat air patrol, you know they're coming. Somebody with a cell phone saw the airport and told them they were taking off. So you take off and you're flying in circles waiting for them to come in. And close air support is the fundamental reason the Marines need an airplane instead of artillery for close air support. They have conflicting requirements. Deck launched intercept requires high sweep and high thrust to weight ratios to climb and fly out fast. Combat air patrol, you need to loiter efficiently. So you need low sweep, low thrust to weight ratios. For close air support, you need high sweep for stable bombing platform and high wing loadings like a transport fighter or transport, commercial transport aircraft. So the way you resolve those is by what we call constraint analysis. So here, the green lines are G's, sustained G's. Uh, you need a big wing to get lots of turning power, lots of turning lift. But to go fast, you need a small wing, that's the brown line. And to make an instantaneous turn, you need the right wing loading. We thought if you put in a very hot airplane, like 1.0 or 9 Gs instantaneous and Mach 3, it would force the thrust up to the point where you wouldn't need anything special for, dirt, for vertical takeoff. But that got too expensive, as you remember from the Pareto curve. So we decided instead to use this lift fan system which gave us some augmentation, but allowed the main cruise engine to be sized for the sweet spot in the maneuver performance. 6G, 7G, Mach 1.5, 1.6, that regime. So that was the airplane we came up with. We call it the Ghost Hawk. It was our Stovall strike fighter for the Marine Corps. The Marines liked it, but fate intervened. They said, we'll We've got this fighter on the beach, but we need to resupply it. So we need some sort of transport aircraft that's also vertical. And they were developing the V-22 Osprey for that. And they were having a lot of trouble. And Cheney was Secretary of Defense at the time. And he canceled it for the third time. And then two months later, the Navy was trying to build their own stealth bomber, the A-12. And they were running into trouble. There's still a lawsuit pending after 20 years. Um, and so he canceled that airplane program, started a new replacement clean sheet approach. So the Marines came to me and they said, look, we like your concept, but we got to get the V-22 back in production. We're a small service. We can do one airplane program at a time. That's all we can manage. So when we get the V-22 flying and in the operational, we'll come back to you. Well, that was the end of the program as far as the Skunk Works was concerned. The B-22 became operational about five years ago. So we would just now be completing some wind tunnel tests. 
And in the Skunk Works, if you don't have a contract, you don't have a program area. And if you don't have a program area, you can't store your documents. So we have to shred everything we did. And I had a rough time there for a year or so, but Faith sometimes helps cuts both ways. Um, General George Molnar took over as head of requirements at Air Combat Command. And um, he wanted to tour industry to see what was going on. And he said, wanted to spend a day at the Skunk Works. Well, we're a small outfit and don't have a lot of programs. We didn't have enough to talk about all day. So Jack Gordon said, why don't you tell him about your Stovall strike fighter for the Marines? Well, I'd been in the Air Force and I knew they weren't gonna be interested in that because Congress would say, you need Stovall? Well, the F-22 is in Stovall, we'll cancel the program. But it occurred to me that if you took out the vectoring nozzle, put a gas tank in place of the lift fan, you'd have an airplane that was basically a stealthy replacement for the F-16. So that's what I briefed him on. And this was my last chart. I said, uh, and sir, here's your um, F-16 replacement. I know you don't have the money for it, but we've also developed a Stobel variant for the Marine Corps and they don't have the money either, but maybe you can get together and together study this. <clears throat> there was a lot of skepticism because when McNamara came to the Defense Department as Kennedy's Secretary of Defense, he said, why don't we do like we do in the car companies? We'll put out a Mercury and a Ford or the same car, but just different paint, different badges. So he forced them to do the F-111 program and it uh, had a separate Navy program office, separate Air Force program office. They were arguing with each other. The Air Force wanted a big bomber and the Navy wanted a small interceptor. And eventually the requirements made the airplane too big for the Navy. So they pulled out and designed the F-14 and left the Air Force with a bomber that was too small to be really effective and too big to be a really great fighter. But I reminded them of the F-86 program, which was originally started as a um, Navy program with a jet engine and a straight wing, which the Air Force then adopted with the same fuselage, but with a swept wing, which the Navy then did the FJ-2 with a swept wing, but thought the wing was too small. So they made extensions to the slats and flaps to make the wing bigger, and that made it maneuver better. And so the Air Force adopted the big wing and it was a very successful program and it was advantage to be combined. Of course, the other joint program was the F-4, which was flown by the Navy, Marines and Air Force. So they went ahead with the joint program. It was a contract to design an Air Force Marine Corps strike fighter, design a flight demonstrator aircraft based on the production aircraft, which <laughs> needed to validate the lift system concept, show that you didn't have hot gas ingestion problems and show that the same airplane could convert from hover to forward flight. We had shredded everything. We had to come up with a proposal in 90 days. So we ripped off the F-22 design, which had wind tunnel tests and stealth RCS tests and came up with our airplane. The difference was, let me back up. The difference was the Air Force felt they needed tails because the Soviets had been demonstrating what they call the Cobra maneuver, where they would pitch up to 90 degrees and then pitch back down. And that's strictly an air show maneuver, but um, they wanted to be able to do that too. So they had tails where we had canards. So we had to use tails and that's <clears throat> the primary reason why the airplane looks like the F-22 and has tails instead of canards. We were viewed as the high risk, high payoff concept. It was a whole new propulsion concept but if it worked, it would be one fine airplane. Um, Congress look, was looking at this program and all the other programs going on. So NASA had their advanced Stovall program. Navy was trying to replace the A-6. They canceled the A-12 and now had the AFX. The Air Force started looking at a single engine replacement for the F-16, the MRF, multi-role fighter. And Congress told them to get together one program the Joint Advanced Fighter. And they tried to do an F-86, um, F-4 concept without the Marine Corps. And Congress told them, no, you got it all wrong. This is the Navy program for the Marine Corps. You look at the Air Force and Navy variants of the Marine airplane. So that became the Joint Strike Fighter program. And these are our three airplanes. 
the Air Force airplane, you can look at the baseline and I use the mnemonic A for airfield to remember which is which. <clears throat> the Marine Corps airplane is the one with the lift fan in it, B for beach. And the C airplane has a bigger wing because it has bigger slats and flaps so it can fly slow enough to get on and off the carrier and bigger control surfaces so that it uh, has the same control power at the lower speeds. And that's uh, what you see when you look at the outside of the airplane. But if you look inside, there's a core airplane with the small flaps and slats and vertical and horizontal stabilizers. That is the Air Force variant. For the Marine variant, you put in the lift fan and the vectoring nozzles. And for the Naval variant, you put on the bigger flaps and slats and control surfaces. <coughs> That's what you see outside. Inside, there were structural differences. Um, an Air Force and Marine airplanes have the vertical descent velocity of 10 feet per second. So it's coming in at 150 knots or whatever, but the vertical velocity is 10 feet per second. The Navy likes to have their airplanes down on the deck and it's pitching deck, wet, stormy night. And so they come down at 25 feet per second. So the main bulkhead that takes the landing loads in the Air Force in a Marine variant is aluminum and normally half an inch thick. Whereas in the Navy variant, it's titanium and three quarters of an inch thick, but it fits into the structure of the airplane in the same location. <clears throat> Here's our model, it's fiberglass and steel, but it's essentially full size using um, the F-18 or F-16 engine and the ATF, the F-22 fan. We took it to NASA, tested it outdoors in the hover rig at various heights above the ground, and then put it in the 80 by 120 tunnel for wind tunnel testing. You can see a couple of our engineers there at the bottom for scale. This was McDonnell Douglas's concept. They did operate it sort of like a turbocharger. They ducted some of the gases off from the cruise engine ducted them forward and instead of having a combustor in their lift engine, they had the hot gases from the cruise engine. They built a model of their propulsion system and decided it wasn't going to work. They couldn't spin up the lift fan fast enough. So they had to run a duct forward for pitch control and another one after to roll for pitch control. They had roll control jets, yaw control jets. They had something like 18 nozzles. And they decided it just wasn't going to work. So they were going to switch to a lift engine. And the Marines told them, don't do that. The Russians have tried the lift engine. It's hot gas ingestion. It's two engines, two mechanics, two thrust stands, two supply lines. Don't do it. The Russians have proven it's not a good idea. And McDonnell Douglas made a big mistake. They thought, well, the Air Force and the Navy are going to love our airplanes so much that the Marines are just going to have to stick with a lift engine. There was a third competitor, although there were only two contracts initially awarded, Boeing. Boeing proposed a concept that they said was like the Harrier. Um, and they had their congressman from Boeing, Norm Dix, say, um, you know, you've got a competition going here. You've got a high risk and a moderate risk concepts. The Harrier works. It's the only concept that's ever worked. You need a low risk alternative like Boeing proposed. So Congress said, okay, we'll put up $10 million if Boeing will match it with 10 million of their own money because we don't have any more money. So Boeing did and they became the third competitor. And the next time I was in uh, Washington, I said, you know, this doesn't seem fair. We had a competition and we won and they lost and now they're bought their way into it. And they said, son, you don't understand. That's what's so great about America. There's more than one way to accomplish something. You can win a competition, or if you can convince your congressman that what you're doing is right, and he can convince enough of his colleagues, he's supposed to represent you, um, they can fund it. That's America. So suck it up and they're a third competitor. This was the Russian concept that was really more similar than the Harrier to the Boeing concept. They weren't one of part of the original competition. So they couldn't get any time at the NASA facilities. So they had to build their own hover stand, but they couldn't test their airplane in transition. 
<clears throat> so our airplane had been to the hover thrust stand, showed it, it had no odd gas ingestion, been through the wind tunnel, showed it could go through transition. Boeing showed they could hover, but didn't show transition. And McDonnell Douglas had a paper airplane. So when the final contracts were awarded, um, it was Lockheed and Boeing that won the contracts to mature the technologies to reduce risk, build aircraft to validate performance, and refine the design as necessary. In other words, we could change our design if we wanted to. So our approach was to build two aircraft but fly all three variants. We didn't want to have to change anything. We wanted to show that we had a good configuration and worked. We wanted to demonstrate what the Marines were interested in, Stovall and supersonic. And since we had never built a Navy fighter, we wanted to prove that we had handling qualities and carrier suitability, suitability for the Navy. And so we took the same approach as we did for our three production airplanes. We built two airframes with no mission equipment in it, no weapons bays, and therefore we could weigh down the Marine the Navy variant to represent the heavier structure, but um, not affect the Air Force and Marine Corps variants. So we flew the aircraft number one first with the smaller flaps and slats and tails on it and explored the conventional flight envelope and then converted it to the Marine Stovall variant and established the hover envelope. The second airplane we devoted to the Navy with the big flaps and slats and control surfaces and tails. But if either airplane had crashed, we could have completed the program with the remaining airframe, which we didn't have to do. This is just a CFD solution illustrating how uh, the thrust distributes. The moment arm to the lift fan was actually shorter because we decided to put it behind the pilot instead of in front of the pilot. So you needed more thrust out of the lift fan than out of the cruise nozzle. And then the roll control jets were just incidental. So a two plus two configuration. The other thing to notice is how the wall jets form as the jets hit the ground and the cold fan jet runs aft and blocks the hot rear post from getting forward. The Marines were um, concerned about landing this airplane, which was twice as heavy as the Harrier on the same surfaces. So we ran one of the first multi-physics calculations, CFD for the jet impingement and heat transfer for the concrete. Concrete spalls at a thousand degrees and we wanted to show that it didn't, wouldn't spall. So we put the pilot in a simulator and he landed it and it only reached around 600 degrees. So um, we thought we'd be safe, but it was interesting. We kind of dismissed the problem at that point. So when Pratt and Whitney built the model of our engine, they built two nozzles, one straight aft and one vectored down at 90 degrees. And of course they ran for more than 15 seconds. So they spalled the concrete, threw great chunks of concrete out into the employee parking lot dented a lot of cars, broke a lot of windshields before they realized, oh, should turn the nozzle upside down. It is a problem if you're more than 15 seconds. Um, we also used a um, moving base simulator, which we used to resolve one of the big arguments the pilots had, whether it had three inceptors, a stick, a throttle, and a nozzle lever like in the Harrier, or two inceptors where we integrated the nozzle lever into the stick. So you pull back the stick, you got flaps, you pull it back further, you got nozzles. And uh, the other thing we did was we qualified the airplane for air to air refueling in the simulator, which turned out to be very important for our program. Um, <clears throat> we used avatars to show that you could perform um, maintenance required. This guy is making some adjustment in a weapons bay. We used to build iron birds and you'd lay out your hydraulics and electronics on this frame that resembled the shape of the airplane to make sure everything integrated didn't interfere with each other. But by this time, all of our suppliers had computer models. So we did a computer simulation to make sure they wouldn't interfere. And then the airplanes were the iron birds. We also switched to 3D CATIA. This is a four body with a different color showing different materials. And I said, hey, that's kind of great. Instead of printing 2D blueprints from this 3D CATIA model, let's put this down on the shop floor for the guys to use when they build the airplane. And the government said, don't do that. 
you guys build airplanes like you do jigsaw puzzles. You give the mechanics a bunch of pieces and you give them a picture of the airplane. You say, put it together so it looks like that. Figure out how it should go together with your computer and um, give them that. So this is what we actually had on the shop floor. This happens to be the um, four body, intermediate four body where the inlet ducts are. Those are the two inlet ducts in yellow. There's the hole where the shaft comes into the engine, out of the engine, into the lift fan. There's the bulkheads. There's the two inner ducts. It goes on. And it didn't run at this speed. They were able to run it and stop it and run it and stop it at whatever speed they wanted. Um, we were only building two airplanes, so we used plastic tools. That thing at the upper right at the, the two o'clock position is the tools for the holes that had to be drilled in the bulkheads for where the shaft went through. And they were different for the Navy and uh, Air Force airplanes. So you didn't want a mistake, but you didn't want to spend expensive tooling. So we just used stereolith. Another labor intensive task was bending tubing. The guy would get a piece of tubing, take it to the airplane, eyeball how much he thought it needed to be bent, go over to the bending machine, bend it, find out it was not enough or too far, and unbend it. Eventually he'd work it out and put it on a pegboard and then bend up the actual piece. We just made a stereolith model from the CATIA system and they put on the pegboard, bent up the first piece of tubing, went right in. Also, there were mom and pop shops all over LA that could build <clears throat> parts cheaper than we could, but they didn't have 3D CATIA systems. So we used Stereolith to make a plastic model of the part and did print 2D blueprints for them. So Boeing actually started flying 30 days before we did. We started 30 days late and um, finished the flight test program at the same time they did because we were able to do air-to-air -air refueling and we piggybacked off the F-22 flight test program. So there were tankers flying in circles and we would go up when the F-22s weren't up there, refuel and fly all day. They would have to come down every hour or so to, for refueling and there's always squawks and you have to fix the squawks before you go back up. So they took 60 days to do what we accomplished in 30 and that amazed people how successful that program was. Here we are converting the Air Force airplane to the Marine variant by dropping the lift fan into the cavity behind the cockpit where the fuel tank had been in the Air Force variant. Usually company pilots fly the airplanes, the X-planes, and they brief the Air Force, Navy, Marine Corps pilots on how wonderful it is. But we had Navy, Air Force, and Marine Corps pilots integrated into our flight test program. And when we went to fly what we call Mission X, the, where the airplane flew supersonic, hovered and landed vertically on the same flight, we arranged for a Marine Corps Major Art Tomasetti Turbo to be the pilot for that mission. So he holds the record of the first um, supersonic VSTOL airplane flight. This is just an infrared picture, but it illustrates what you saw in that CFD calculation. Um, the hot gases are in white, the cold fan, lift fan gases are invisible, but they're there. And you can see that as the airplane comes down to the ground, the presence of that cold lift fan blocks the hot gases from coming forward and creating any hot gas ingestion. Here's a picture of the airplane over the Naval Academy. Tom Morgenfeld was our chief test pilot and he was a graduate of the Naval Academy. And as it turned out, his roommate at the Academy was now Commandant. Um, the Naval Academy is 150 miles north of Patuxent River, which was where we were running our Naval air tests. But Tom called his roommate and said, have the midshipmen in formation at 1300 hours and tell them to look up and they'll see something neat. So he did and they did. And uh, we got the phone ringing off the hook in LA, Texas um, and Pax River. What's the airplane doing up at Patuxent River? Tom said he'd gotten lost. So here's a flight test of the first Air Force variant. We retracted the gear because it's only 40 miles from our plant to the Edwards Air Force Base, but uh, the, the McDonnell Douglas had trouble retracting their gear. 
So we retracted ours to show that we didn't have that problem. This is the Marine or the Navy variant at Patuxent River doing bolters. They simulate, they miss the wire and have to take off again right away. Navy said this airplane is ready to go on the ship. And here's the Marine Corps variant. You can see the nozzle vectoring down at the rear and it lifts off like it's on a hydraulic lift. It was beautiful. Here it is cleaning up. Now watch the rear nozzle. It vectors down and the airplane takes up, it takes off at 300 feet. And here it's going supersonic. This is strictly an air show maneuver. If you've seen the Harrier in an air show, they turn to the left, turn to the right, bow to the crowd. It's terrific. And we wanted to show them they could continue to make um, great air shows. They asked us if we could put in a seat for congressmen. These are the aluminum mats that the Marines take down on the beach in the desert. We wanted to show that the airplane could land in those same aluminum mats. So we had 40,000 pounds of thrust because we had a large mass flow of air at low velocity. Boeing stayed with the cruise mass flow of air at a high velocity, had only 32,000 pounds of thrust. And as you can see, they had to take off the landing gear doors, the inlet cowl, other parts from the airplane. I think the pilot was flying in his underwear in order to hover. So um, we won that competition. Generally, you say when you won to yourself, ah, oh, that was technically brilliant. But if the other guys win, you say, oh, they lowballed their bid. That's why they won. But Boeing was very professional. They credited the lift fan for the win. And so did Aviation Week and Interavia, which is the European version of Inter Aviation Week. They credited that lift fan propulsion system for the win. But I think there's other factors involved. Pilots like to look good on the ramp. And here are the two airplanes side by side. Um, we were in that hangar on the uh, right and they were in the hangar on the left. And we could hear um, the chatter speakers up on the wall in the tower. And they were referring to the Boeing airplane as Monica after Monica Lewinsky. I think because it's kind of chubby looking, but uh, we knew we had won the uh, beauty contest. The pilots felt they looked good in our airplane. And the next year we won the, uh, the lift fan, won the um, Collier Trophy for the greatest achievement in aeronautics or astronautics in America the previous year. We won a contract to build 22 airplanes. That seems like a lot, but there was an Air Force test program, Navy test program, Marine test program. So seven airplanes each and then one stealthy airplane, then 465 initial production aircraft. You remember, um, well, you know that the program is over budget, late, over cost, et cetera. People have said it's because there were the three variants, but that wasn't the reason. I've shown you the reason why. Here's another airplane, the A7 Corsair that was flown by all three services. The reason was because of the Pareto rule. Um, when they canceled the F-117, the Air Force needed a stealthy fighter bomber. When they canceled the F-22, they needed an air superiority fighter. So they said the Joint Strike Fighter is only seven and a half Gs. It needs to be nine Gs. It doesn't have a gun. It needs to have a gun. It doesn't have any wing pylons. It needs to load up wing pylons. It needs to carry 2,000 pound Mark 84 bombs. And the biggest thing is um, everybody with the research project said, gee, I hear this is going to be the last manned airplane. If I don't get my gizmo on it, it'll never fly. So they made arguments to load the airplane up with every new concept. And the biggest one that cost the most time and trouble in our delay, $5 billion was this helmet that allows the pilot to look through the floor. No pilot has ever said he needs to look through the floor. And in fact, it ran into problems. They would look through the floor and see the enemy airplane below them, you know, red flag exercises when it was actually 100 yards off the right wing. The computers weren't fast enough with the image processing to be timely. And so we had to switch suppliers and develop a new helmet. It was a big mess. However, the airplane now has two variants, stealth mode where it's clean, the original airplane, and what they're calling beast mode where it's loaded up with the pylons and the weapons and all the rest of the new gadgets. 
So what we've done is proven the Pareto rule works again. The last 20% of performance going from seven and a half Gs to nine Gs, adding a gun, adding wing pylons drove 80% of the costs. And that's why the program's late and over budget. There are now 550 aircraft in service, 385 with the air forces of the world, 115 with the naval forces of the world and 60 with our American US Navy, F-35Cs. And I wanna mention that this wasn't a purely Lockheed program. We were teamed with BAE Systems and Northrop Grumman on the airframe. Rolls-Royce and Pratt & Whitney teamed on the uh, propulsion system. But the real key was the Joint Program Office. Instead of having Air Force, Navy, and Marine Corps program offices, <coughs> they had one program office where the management rotated between the financial exec and program manager between the three services every year or two. And they came out with one set of requirements. They did the arguing inside the office and gave us one set of requirements we could work towards. So that's pretty close to an hour. And um, I finished my prepared remarks. If anybody has any questions, Brenda, if we have time. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Thank you for that amazing presentation. So yeah, so now we can um, open up to questions. Um, if you'd like, you can type out your question in the chat um, if you don't want to speak out loud on the microphone and I'll read it off or um, feel free to unmute yourself and ask. So yeah, any questions? Yeah, hello, this is uh, John Tellis, a uh, member of AIAA. Thank you so much, Paul, for your, uh, uh, what an eye opener. Uh, can't say enough about it. Thank you. One of the questions I have is um, the qualifications of your staff while you were working on all of this. Uh, are all of these, or were they all extremely senior, uh, highly, highly experienced engineers, or did you have room for uh, almost intern level uh, people out of school? Uh, I'm asking on behalf of the student body, what's their chances of ever seeing a program like this, you know, not long after graduation? Well, um, pretty good, I think. Um, I recommend most students start their careers in the government because they give you a lot more responsibility in the government. If you get known, you can then get hired into a company at a more senior position. But <clears throat> we had young people and young and um, older senior people on the program. Skunk Works is a small organization and there was a lot going on, the F-22 um, and the uh, AFX and the F-117. So I couldn't fully staff up with senior people. So I brought some people over from the California company, the commercial division, and they were young hires that I had known at NASA. They worked at NASA and then left the government, came to work for the Lockheed California company. But I give a word of advice to the young engineers. When we got on the program, the old skunk said, just tell us what you want and we'll make it work. And the young guy said, oh, that'll never work. We can't do that. <laughs> um, you've got to get some experience or confidence in yourself and give it a go. You've got to be willing to try it. And I know the, the other classic problem is when you're trying to put a proposal together, the young engineers always wanted lots of time to make sure they've got plenty of time to do the job. But as a proposal manager, you're trying to get the proposal as cheap as possible. You want the minimum time to get the work done. And so the most common complaint you hear is, oh, that program manager cut my time. But understand his problem. You've got to, is when you get in the company, you wanna become expert at one thing, the go-to guy at one thing, but you need to know what's going on in the other disciplines, like you saw in that 1930s picture and why they think the way they do and to be able to talk to them as professionals to hammer out the truth like the Wright brothers did. So we had an interesting mix. It made me, my hair fall out, but okay. <laughs> well, do you figure that they were in fact uh, qualified coming out of school or young as they were? Was their education, in your opinion, adequate? Um, yes, it was adequate. They were in fact um, better with computers, of course, than some of the old guys who refused to use computers. But I remind you that we hit the moon with slide rules and missed Mars with computers. 
And the problem with the students had, the young guys had with computers is they believe the computers. They had no wisdom to say this number can't be right. And you know, with a slide rule, we would get three digits, but we didn't know where the decimal point is. So you had to do a back of the envelope calculation to figure out whether it was one, 10 or 100 that you knew where to put the decimal point. And so you had a check on what you were writing down. And we had one guy try to use the code from the C-130 for the hypersonic program. I mean, you can't do that, but it was a computer program, right? So you put the airplane in, you get the performance. <laughs> Thank you very much. Yeah, those were great questions. Sir, I'm sorry I missed you a couple years ago at uh, NAVAIR. I'm a NAVAIR employee piggybacking on the student branch's uh, Zoom call tonight, but I, I'm, I really enjoyed the presentation. And the, the Vestal Wheel of Misfortune, that's your creation? Well, I started it. That particular color version was done by the program office. That's, that's still up at Vertical Flight Society. I use that all the time. And, and I'm, I'm very curious to pick your brain as we go to kind of the electric VTOL um, future um, uh, and looking at the way you approach the problem for, for F-35, um, what, what do you see out there using you know, electricity and batteries? Well, batteries, of course, are still the problem as they are with cars. Um, batteries have, uh, they're a 100 year old technology, 150 year old technology. And technology generally follows an S curve, you know, slow advance, then breakthroughs, rapid advance, and then diminishing returns. And there's a lot of forecasting of fantastic performance coming from batteries. So battery is going to be the challenge, I think. We know how to do VSTOL, I believe. Um, we've had experience now with the Harrier. The Russians have experience. We have experience. We don't want to lose it, I'm afraid. Completely agree. Thank you, sir. Well, I'll follow up here a little bit. Uh, do you think we'll ever see an autonomous V-stall aircraft? Right after we have autonomous cars. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, don't know. I don't know if I want that even. <laughs> no, it's a little scary to me. I mean, autonomous cars are traversing in two dimensions and we've got three dimensions. Yeah. And so it's going to be challenging. You know, there's the classic trolley problem you're in a trolley going down the tracks and you see three people on the tracks ahead of you and you can throw the switch and go to the other track and hit one person and kill him. What are you going to do? Well, the answer for autonomous cars and airplanes is you kill the driver, the passenger in the car. You don't <laughs> take the responsibility for killing anybody outside the car. So I'm not sure I want to ride in the car that some guy in his mother's basement eating pizzas has programmed to kill me if it doesn't you know, work. <laughs> and we've had problems. I don't know if you remember the hard landing, we called it, on the F-22. Um, Tom Morgenfeld was making low passes over the runway for the photographers from Aviation Week and Interavia and so forth. And he realized he was getting a little too slow, so he hit afterburner. And no one had figured that anyone ever hit afterburner going slow with the gear down. So the computer rebooted, and he pancaked in. Oh, my God. Mm. You have to, you can't anticipate everything. And that's the scary part of it. And, you know, the uh, Max, Boeing Max problem was just that. They didn't anticipate what would happen. It's just really hard. Hmm. Students ask me, what should I study if I'm interested in electrical propulsion? I said, legal law. <laughs> Well, Brenda, it looks like um, we're done. Oh, I had one more question. Yeah. Um, so earlier in your slideshow, you showed the, the depiction of somebody like accessing the F-35, maybe doing some kind of maintenance on it. Um, how do you design for uh, like the maintenance of the aircraft, like making things easier, or access to components easier when it's time to replace them? 
Oh, well, you, I'd get into a lot of detail, but you have to consider it when you're putting the airplane together. The F-18 was the first airplane designed for ease of access. They have um, plugs on the landing gear where you can plug an instrument in and read the system you know, for operations. They're also on the F-35, they now have prognostics where the computers watch everything. And when something starts to fail, they send a message back to the ship or the Air, Air Force Base that this part is failing. When they get there, they have the part ready and the manual open to the right page on the computer screen so they can do a quick repair. So it's prognostics and um, ease of access. I mean, your cars are doing the same thing now. There's that plug you plug in and you run it and it tells you what's wrong with your car. Thank you. All right, are there any last minute questions before we close off for the night? Okay. Um, all right. So, um, yeah, thank you so much, Mr. Bevaloka. That was fascinating. Um, so, yeah, we can go ahead and end for the night. Thank you, everyone, for coming.